Well, I just want to quickly let you know that my interest in this film is because it actually uh, existed confronting the founding fathers of the United States. Many people do not know that ordinary Africans finding themselves in the circumstances of slavery challenged all the historical moments of the United States, including the War of Independence, the Jefferson, George Washington. They also confronted the, before even that, they confronted the British, the Spanish, the French in Louisiana, in Florida, uh, in the northern part of the United States. And then the founding fathers, Jefferson, George Washington, George Washington tried to smoke the Africans out of the Dismal Swamp, for example, not known in history. And then in the Civil War, they again fought with the different forces. Uh, and it is a historical chapter that the United States suppresses, when in fact it's known in Jamaica, Suriname, Haiti, Brazil, is not known in the United States. My interest is it lets African descendants in America uh, know their history makers too. Because in my view, the contention of history is Europe says Africa has no history. And then Africans insisted, yes, they have confronted and uh, lived up to their own historical circumstances. I think that's very important for all white and black kids to know. Because uh, in the United States, white kids grow up thinking they have to free black people. And then black people have no historical documentation because it's suppressed to say, I fought for my own freedom, which is a very important psychological state of mind to be in. Thank you. So if you have any question, I'll be very happy to answer. Barry Woodbury. Billy Woodbury. He's one of the filmmakers who made the film uh, bless our little heart, or he, he's worked a lot with Charles Burnett. He was in this film school with us. Uh -huh. okay. uh, and Columbus, who discovered America, joking. Go ahead. Sankofa is a film. Huh? Sankofa. Sankofa? Sankofa. Yeah. I can see it on yeah. YouTube. I hope so. uh, no, on YouTube, no, here in the screening room. Yeah, next, yeah. Next, next month? This month, yeah. This month. In April, yeah. When? When, I don't know, but uh, there is a program. There is a program. Yeah. Uh, it's almost. Uh, Taib Luigi. Taib Luigi is yeah. the Tunisian <laughs> filmmaker yeah. who's uh, now paralyzed, but he's still making a film in Tunisia. About. Uh, Tunisia. About what? Hmm? What's the subject of this film? He's a North African. He makes a film about Africa. Oh. Yeah. There was a question in there. <coughs> yes. Um, th this is uh, a subject that many people, I'm from Mexico, and I, this is a subject that I have never heard of. I, I've traveled in the north of Mexico and I didn't know of it. Um, there, well, there is a part where one of the characters, or one of the people you interviewed, he says that the Greek nation, they really didn't feel comfortable with Maroons living in their, in their territory. Yeah. <coughs> However, the Seminoles, they embraced them. And so the Seminoles, as far as I know, were living mainly in Florida. So my question is, I, I, I didn't quite get how they got to Brackettville. So from Florida to Texas, are there are a few states in the middle. How yeah, I know. Happen? Well, if you study about the Jackson that became president, Andrew Jackson, three wars to make him a president of the United States is against the Seminole uh, forces in Florida. Three wars, War I, War II, War III. He became the Eisenhower of that period. And uh, one of his missions by the presidents, like uh, Jackson and Monroe and all the other presidents before him, to take all the Indians into the Indian Territory. That's Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. And then Mexico comes, and I'll tell you. 
So it's a history not known. Even Mexico does not know Africans in Mexico. This is a fact. I'm going to Nascimento to interview. I've interviewed a man from Nascimento who is a descendant of these people. He comes every September to Brackettville, Texas, on the border of Mexico and the United States, and celebrates always without the system. This is black people sustaining history by folklore and passing it. They always have a designated storyteller. When Miss Charles died, Woolly Warrior became the designated storyteller. So these are historical facts. But if you have to know one thing, you know what gentrification is? Yeah, gentrification is when you remove people. Uh, for example, in South Carolina, as American whites, Anglo-Saxons were bringing more settlers, they have to remove Africans and Native Americans who are in the forests fighting for their independence. They went to Florida. A well-known history is called the Steno Rebellion, where they even uh, confronted the United States Army with military strategy. They went to St. Augustine, Florida. From St. Augustine, Florida, they joined up with Native Americans, etc. And um, many wars happened, led by Abraham, African, led by John Horse, Africans, with Seminole Indians. But Seminole is not only Indian, it's also Africans. They come, Seminoles come out of many Indian nations, including Creeks. But Creeks were mercenaries for slavery. They would catch Africans and sell them back to slavery. So the Seminole concept is more a democratic Indian and African unity to fight against the United States slave colony. And so when they were had three wars and defeated, they are taken through Louisiana. In the Trails of Tears, you know about what happened to Indians, I'm sure. It's called the Trails of Tears. Many movies, even Hollywood, not good, done. But Africans are in that Trails of Tears too. In fact, slave owners coming to capture them, saying, this is my slave, this is my slave, although it's six, five generations distant from slavery. And so that group moves into uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas. The fight continues between Creek Indians and Seminole African Indian unity. Then they escaped to Mexico, made a treaty with the Mexican government to be border armies and settled in Nascimento. And this is many books describes that. In fact, John Horse is, uh, died in Mexico because he didn't want to return after the Civil War. And so it's a very long history. Myself, when I started making Sankofa, I became aware of it, and I'm interested in Africa's people's history. So I, I researched and tried to know more and make a film about it. Uh, greetings. Thank you very much for this wonderful documentary. Uh, at some point, there is also a reference to the Gula. And I Gala. The Gala, Gala. And I remember uh, doing researches in uh, linguistic on the Gola. There is a book by Jay Turner on the Gola, and uh, where it shows that linguistically there is a strong retention of Africanism, the language from West Africa all the way down to Congo even. Yeah. And he went to SOAS, he did uh, researches, traveled to Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is that, uh, it's not well known uh, both to uh, younger generations how much uh, the uh, how strong was the retention of Africanism uh, in that part of the state if you compare to let's say Cuba where you had the Abaqua secret society apparently up to the 1940s you could hear a dialect of Yoruba Kikongo in Matanza mm -hmm. uh, I went to Brazil in uh, Salvador and I saw a strong retention whereas in the states um, and in Cuba, Cuba and Brazil, also in the music, there's still that strong rhythmic uh, heritage, legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, now we know that a musician like uh, Don Cherry, Cecil Taylor, who had of uh, African, of Indian uh, music, they, they try to promote that aspect. But you doing those researches, were you able also, because at some point they spoke a dialect of Gula, mm -hmm. and you doing those researches, how much were you able to unearth that um, Proto-African language, so to speak, because it is important. Resistance is also the language, 
and how much were you able to unearth that? Uh, it's not, yeah, it's not only in the language, it's also in the food. You find it in Brazil, Africa. It's also in the religion in Brazil. Catholicism is literally swallowed by African ritual. So it's also in the religion. But the Gala, the Gala population uh, comes from the South Carolina coastland. But this idea of Seminole is a Gala nation struggle all the way, and it goes all the way to Canada. So I don't want to go extensively, but to tell you the truth, jazz itself, for example, in Cuba, Cuba, if you study Cuba, you have to go to Louisiana, Louisiana to Haiti. That is how you're going to really tie it up good, especially if you're interested in linguistic. Uh, if you look at, for example, I think Bambula, for example, means I will never forget my village dance. And then you understand why enslaved people, tired, so tired, but they still dance to resurrect their energy to dance because they're remembering their home. The problem here is Eurocentric analysis made Africans, non-culture, non-human, savage movement, savage dance, but in every dance, in every activity, including basket weaving, I want to remember where I came from. The quilt, for example, in the southern part of the United States, quilting is an African transformation. But jazz is also, I'm, I don't agree, for example, uh, what happened in the United States, for example, the drum was snatched because it became an instrument of rebellion. So when the drum was taken, Africans then have to transform a new underground music to call rebellion. Jazz is that. Even jazz itself, jazz means jackass music by what? White people. Jazz is, um, is considered in the turn of, uh, when it came Louis, from King Oliver to Louis Armstrong given, it's a ridiculed form of music. Uh, and Europeans called it a savage music. Uh, they used to demonize it. It used to be considered a pornographic culture. Uh, and yet, when it surfaced on the Congo Square in Louisiana, it comes from underground resistance music. Don Cherry, I wanted to use him, for example, my music, you're right, he keeps that, that lineage, but jazz is the highest cultural retention of the African people in the Americas. If you look at it, you'll find all this connection. So jazz itself is not, it is an African music transformed due to the new American historical and experiential experience. And so language is not only the talking, it's only the sound they made to rebel, to organize, to come together. So you find dance, for example, is physical movement impossible for white plantation owners to decode. Therefore, the Africans will talk about how to kill the slave owner by body movement. The problem here is Africans with an Afrocentric academic uh, capacity have not yet tackled how Africa survived in America. Because uh, you have to know it was a constant rebellion. The first Africans with the Spanish arrive in the New America. They killed all the Spanish, joined with Native Americans, and began the historical aspect of this idea of marunaj. Marunaj in the Spanish in the Spain mean, in Spanish means wild people you can't contain. That's basically what it means. Even Seminole comes from this idea of wild. It's not a native, there was no Native Americans before the phenomena of this unity of what American government calls the Negro War, one time, one time Seminole War. When they wanted financed by Congress, they call it Seminole War because they couldn't get a new, the new enemy is not financed, the Negro War. And also they don't want to admit Africans took him to task. Otherwise, that whole Louisiana rebellion, that whole Louisiana, Florida rebellion, it is African rebellion against the United States government. Now, in America, I would get money. I'm still doing it. It's not finished. This is just to get money with you know powers that have the money. I have 140 hours interview. It's going to be a very long folkloric film. And the reason it's not liked is because uh, even when the MacArthur Foundation came to interview me, I told them, these black people, they didn't go to no university. They didn't go to no Jefferson University but they challenged the Founding Fathers. 
you don't have to be educated. You have to only be a human to say, I don't accept slavery. Like you and me would not accept slavery. Why would they accept? Now, if they're powerless, there's power relationship, they wait for the day. And it's, that's why America, Latin America, even in Mexico, the rebellion is untold still. There were slave revolts. Even after the Brazilian uh, abolishing of the so-called slavery, most of them went to Mexico. And Mexicans put them to war. And if you find some of the wrestlers in Mexico are Africans. I want to go to my next film, if you don't mind. The next one is also precious for me. It's about the Italian-Ethiopian War. It's the first part I'm just showing you only. But it's a very important film because this is one history human beings are denied. In my view, <laughs> my father believes the Second World War began in Ethiopia. I also believe that, unless black people are not human. Mussolini invaded Ethiopia in 1935. The League of Nations superpowers of England, France said, go take Ethiopia. Finally, when Mussolini joined Hitler, uh, then the game changed. Thank you. Watch the film and we'll have a discussion. This is a follow-up to the first film I made in the 1890s, uh, well, not 1896, about the Anwar War of 1896. I made a documentary film that opened in Venice. It was called Adwa, An African Victory. That was uh, financed by a German WDR Arte, co-production with my company. This one is strictly my own. I haven't got co-production yet. Um, <clears throat> it's five, six parts. Uh, it goes into first, this, what you saw is the lingering memory. Ethiopians live with the memory. And then I have part two, the invasion. And part three, a war crime, atrocity, including Graziani's atrocity in Ethiopia. And then guerrilla warfare, how Ethiopians uh, literally did not let Italians settle uh, to uh, claim uh, having conquered Ethiopia. The peasants went into guerrilla warfare with some nationalist movements. Then the last part is victory. Uh, it's about how the, when Mussolini declared with Hitler, then England uh, said, oh, then in Ethiopia we will help. But at that time, Ethiopians have fought five years of guerrilla warfare and uh, the rest is history. So if you have any question, I'll be very happy. I have one question about Congo Square, it was broken about. Um, I went there in 83, uh, there was nothing to see, but people, uh, old men, were sitting there and they told me here, Jazz was born. But what happened? Was there a battle on Congo Square? Because you say Jazz was rebellion. rebellion. Well, happened to something? No, Congo first Street? Jazz comes underground. You have to know, for example, do you know Quilombo? Uh, for example, in, in Brazil, it's uh, the Maroon movement is an underground movement. And, but it's a culture, underground movement started in Congo for those who came from that region. And so in Louisiana, what you have here in Louisiana is Senegambia, Congo people with Cuba and Haitian uh, transaction. And <clears throat> as they, if, if you see all the rebellions in America are connected to Maroons, all the rebellion from the documented officially ones, 1802, the, Gabriel Prosser in Virginia, uh, 1822, uh, uh, Denmark VC in South Carolina, uh, 1832, Nat Turner, Virginia. But all are connected. Nat Turner, his father was a maroon in the Great Dismal Swamp where I shot the location. And so when they finally surfaced in Congo Square, Congo Square is just a gathering of Africans with different uh, origin. And so jazz is nothing uh, but 
a transformation of the blues of the African people. You see, jazz just went another level because Africans all have blues. They brought the blues culture. And then it's, it's a different uh, blues from different places. To coexist, it has to be jazzified. To coexist. With instruments? Huh? With instruments or not? On anything. You know, with hand, body instruments, anything. Because, you know, the individual, it's like Africans came to, in slavery speaking, Wolof, uh, you know, Congo, etc. What happens? They created a communications, a language to communicate, to do whatever they have to do. So the music itself went through a metamorphosis. Uh, uh, excuse me, I have a question about the, the, the second film. Um, what was the role of Halia Selassie? Well, he was the king. Uh, he was the king of Ethiopia at the time Italians invaded Ethiopia. Uh, but it's also um, a time of a complete weakness in the history of Ethiopia. Uh, Halia Selassie was transforming from Minilik. The, you saw in the end of the picture, Minilik had this uh, uh, regional autonomy kings, and he's the king of kings. And Haile Selassie completely changed and transformed it into his central uh, government, whereby all the regional uh, power uh, was undermined. And the Italians knew the conflict. In many places, Haile Selassie had a war going on with Wallo. He had Begum Durgunder war. He has in the southern part war. And the Italians said, this is the time now to go in. Mussolini knew because uh, all over Ethiopia, only Italy had consulates all over Ethiopia. In, Tigre, in, uh, in Adwa, Bekale, Dese, Gondar, Adisava, Godjam. And they were all working. This is after the Battle of Adwa. I just can't go too deep because of time. Uh, let me know when we are getting close. <laughs> go ahead. Your uh, question is, uh, you say the first Adwa was co-produced by Acte, Germany. Did you try it for this? And you didn't get money, or you didn't try yet to, to get producers? And well, if not, why? <laughs> well, two things. I, uh, I think Arte, WDR Arte also began to be interested in, uh, when I did the first Adwa, they were interested in Africa. Then German and Arte in Europe is always fashionable. They are into uh, the breaking of the, the Soviet Union and, and uh, uh, Bosnia, Yugoslavia, and they told me, excuse me, and so also, European television is like now uh, a colonized, un-American appendage television planet. When I did the first Adwa, there were classic German-French producers who cared about African issue. Well, the first one, uh, Eckerstein, is a well-known producer. He co-produced my film. When I wrote him a letter, he said, oh, I know you. I want to be with it. So I had freedom to say what I want, etc. And so European television, the young Europeans are more American than even a bombastic American. So I was not able to create any communications. It's not the Europe I know. The other part of it, in terms of Italy, Luce. Uh, Luce was begun, Luce and Cinecitta was begun by Mussolini. I opened my first film in Venice, a festival began by Mussolini. And many Italians were having a hard time my declaration that I was happy to open my film in, hit in Mussolini's festival. And they were angry at me, called me fascist and everything. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, uh, the newspapers accused them why Germans are involved, not Italians. Cinecita president wrote me, next, you free, the next part, we want to be part of it. Up to today, they are vacillating. I've been 26 years making this film with my own money. That's why it's taking me long. I, every time I go to Ethiopia, I find alive. Now they're all dead. All the veterans are dead. I haven't shot for 
you know, those I found were precious. I shot them, men and women, fighters who fought the Italians. But to me, uh, again, when you tell them your own history, it begins a big problem, especially when you don't have an Af like I said yesterday, African countries that also care about this history. I don't like to beg Europeans. Africans should produce films like this, but African elites are completely bankrupt culturally. So is the most of the people, the rich Ethiopians are hopeless. So where do you go? You take years to finish the film you believe in. I did. Thank you. This history, is it being taught in school in, in Ethiopia right now? I would say this, not, co not correctly. It's all uh, according to the, the elite that came back from exile. You see, what you have to know is, as Italians occupied Ethiopia, not really occupied, but they were all over trying to put fires out, Emperor Haile Selassie went to London two narratives. He went to London to go to the League of Nations to fight internationally. But to the guerrilla fighters, he was a traitor because he brought a spiritual defeat uh, because most fighters followed leaders. Kings were critical. And so when the king left, guerrilla fighters were in trouble. So all the guerrilla fighters began to look for kings. So they went after Liji Yasu's sons. Rasa, uh, Rasa Bebe, a major fighter, well known all over Europe, Afro, you'll see him in my next third film. He made a Liji Yasu son, a king. In the Gondar area, Rasa Mora Wuble got another Liji Yasu king. Emperor Haile Selassie is in London. It's a big tragic time. But when he came, he, he authored, he's a very powerful, uh, he is amazing, short, not physical in terms of Lijiyasu, for example, can ride a horse, can fight Gook's uh, horse fight. Haile Selassie is very paper, paper man, manipulator, very francophonic. And in the end, uh, he outsmarted all the other Ethiopians and then narrated a new history and completely suppressed the guerrilla warfare to a point where the British claimed they freed Ethiopia. This is offensive to Ethiopians who fought guerrilla warfare. And so some of them were hanged. Some of the guys you heard today, they can't forget Balai Zaleka was hanged by Emperor Haile Selassie because he wanted to dictate the narrative. And so Italians were not taken to task. A war crime uh, was settled under the table. We are told the bridge was built by the Italians, what, for millions who died in poison gas? It's crazy. So it's an Ethiopian elite that came from exile, like in South Africa now. All the exiles returned and the internal uh, structure and them are fighting now. The same thing happened in Ethiopia. The elite came back from Europe, Sudan, Egypt, Eden, Malagasy, and they began to direct the narrative of this history. Otherwise, in my view, the most heroic people are those who took Italians by guerrilla warfare. Regionally, the Oromos in the Oromo area, the Amaras in the Amara area, all kinds of people. And their story was abandoned. Even Eritreans who betrayed Italians and joined Ethiopians, it's amazing history. All lost to a point now, ethnically, we are divided people, in my view. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I'm here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm half half Italian and half Ethiopian, so oh my God. I, I know I know what you're what what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My grandfather they came to to Ethiopia, you know, and then they they married more or less, you know, to Ethiopian uh, women. Uh -huh. uh, so no, I have a remark and a and a question. The, the the remark is a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there has been a movie at the you know, Italian Institute, uh, Cultural Institute, uh, Loredana Bianca. Uh, yeah, and uh, and and the movie was uh, the title was um, overseas, and one of the point of the m of the of the lady of the uh, of the director was that uh, in Italy there has been uh, the, the, the memory of the uh, of the of the colon colonialization in in, in in Ethiopia has been totally lost, so uh, the Italians they don't they don't they don't remember 
what you know the colonization was in in, in Ethiopia. So I think this movie, as the Italian of, as, as the Loredana Bianconi movie, is quite interesting because they are, they, you are working on the mem on, on on the memory. So this is very very important also for the young generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the remark and. Um, and a couple of weeks ago at the parliament, there has been another conference of uh, some uh, people coming from Oromia. And I was, you know, as a, I'd like you know, to know your point, your position about what is happening nowadays in Ethiopia, or what is up, if you have any position on, on this, of course, after, you know, the latest uh, problems of the state of emergency. And, and, and I know you're not a politician, of course, I can, but I, I think, I guess you, you, you have. So first a remark about the memory. And the question about what is happening today in, in Ethiopia. Thank well, you very first, much. let me tell you, Ethiopians uh, are crazy like any Af all Africans. We're crazy people. We're people who are in total contradiction with our history. We fight with ourselves. And uh, the reason for me is because we don't know our history. And this is uh, even like when, when you look at the Oromo, for example, Oromo history. Uh, the three prominent generals of the guerrilla warfare are Oromo folks. Um, and yet their history is not known by educated Ethiopians. Marxist Ethiopians who are against emperor do not know this history. In fact, they study guerrilla warfare in, in China when in fact Mao talks about Ethiopian guerrilla warfare. You can tell how, you know, it ships at night. Uh, Ethiopian intellectuals are destabilized by the coming of England into Ethiopia. Because what you have to know, the last chapter of my film is how England destabilized Ethiopia, wanted to recolonize Ethiopia, and peasant Ethiopians had a shootout with the British. You don't know that? No Ethiopian knows that. The peasants were fighting the British when they were trying to recolonize Ethiopia. Churchill's idea is Ethiopia should not be free because we're going to lose Sudan, all the colonial. The Ethiopia defies colonialism. That's, that's a very important symbolism. Ethiopia defies the idea of Africans cannot govern themselves. Uh, arrogant history that traces back, mythically even, to Sheba and Solomon and all that stuff. So the Churchill group said, we don't want this um, narrative. Uh, all the soldiers who fought in Ethiopia should not take the disease back to their African countries. Nigerians, even Indians came to fight with the, with the British. Many Indians died in the current war. More Indians. British were like three, four British for every 1,000 Africans. And so one thing I know is my father's generation understood colonialism because they knew fighting back historically not my generation. My generation only knew there is a feudalism in Ethiopia, there was no history, and we're going to take Ethiopia to a moon, uh, moon age called uh, communism. Even for that, it didn't speak to the local people and it became a disaster. The left-wing Ethiopians became historyless. Okay? So that's what you have to know. But it doesn't mean we have finished that war. Present contemporary Ethiopians are confused. Why? They don't know their history. This is my contention. This is why I'm making this film, personally. Because it's the crux of the matter of Ethiopian transformation is this battle. We did not have the history of these warriors, barefoot Ethiopian warriors. The British began a new narrative saying, we freed Ethiopia. I myself said it to an Ethiopian fighter, the British free freed us, he tried to kill me. He says, my, I lost seven brothers fighting the Italians. How in the hell would you even say the British freed me? Now, where is this narrative? There's more books about the British getting rid of Ethiopians. Not only that, they declared they took guerrilla warfare to Ethiopia. The British showed up in the war in 1940. Ethiopian teachers teach this, that Winget brought guerrilla warfare in Ethiopia. For five years, Ethiopians were fighting guerrilla warfare, a very sophisticated that made Italians not settle in Ethiopia. In Jimma, I mean, the, if you well, you'll see the film if you get to see the film. I, you, it's an amazing history. But the problem here is, 
Ethiopian elite themselves began to give to credits to British to a point where the British, their handful, became our liberators. We don't even pay attention to Indians who died for us from India as British colonial soldiers in current war. We don't even pay, pay tribute to Sudanese warriors who came with the British, who died. Many, uh, in fact, one Ethiopian freed, uh, liberated Winget from almost dying on a horseback and left all the Sudanese to die. And then when, when the British write the history, they write liberating Ethiopians, a different narrative. And our teachers taught us that. Our emperor was a friend of the British. His great-grandson came to my editing room and he said, why are you criticizing the British? They were my grandfather's best friends. Well, I told him, you're right. They made him a king, good king. He should be a friend, but I told him, they are my enemies because they try to recolonize my father. And so the contradictions, Ethiopians are sophisticated people. The peasants, the workers, their language is full of mystery. When an Ethiopian says, say hello to you, their subtext is questioning, who are you? What's your motive? He's not just embracing her. Don't look at these modern Ethiopians that are completely think, like now in Ethiopia, if you're a white restaurant service, you can see how uh, a few, few Europeans try to move, remove me and an Ethiopian filmmaker from a dinner table, say they need our table. And Ethiopian waiters came and say, move for the white people. In swimming pools at the Hilton, you find racism. Ethiopians have never been occupied, but the new Ethiopians are mentally occupied and do not even know racism if it kissed them. So we have a different situation. The other part of it is the confusion of Ethiopians is the confusion of elites in Africa. This Ethiopian confusion of ethnic, ethnic fighting, religious fighting, is all a desperate uh, response to alienation has nothing to do with the cause of the problem. To me, an Oromo is not my problem. But a Gondares, they were meeting somewhere and us <laughs> talking about uh, Oromos killed them. And then the Oromos talk about Amara killing them. This what? Poor head, uh, impoverished brain, manipulated by a non historical point, but by desperate uh, circumstances that they cannot, they don't have the imagination to rise above it. And Ethiopia will be the next Rwanda. Because, yeah, we used to brag, no, Rwanda will not happen in Ethiopia. It will happen in Ethiopia. Because many mindless, irrational, completely uh, greedy Ethiopians have risen after the military junta. With this new government, they are transporting. I mean, one, t one other thing you have to know is a lot of the money is coming out of Ethiopia to build. Ethiopians are building big structures in Europe, and like Iranians, like Nigerians, like you know, <laughs> Angolans. I'll get drunk if I tell you. Like uh, Congolese, they're building Europe with their money, not their country. All the African elites are buying the biggest real estates in Europe and America. In America, Ethiopians come in America with suitcases of money leaving Ethiopia, going to like Dubai or somewhere, cleaning the money from stolen money. It's cleaned in Dubai as a rational money. It enters America and Europe. That's Africa. That's the new Ethiopia. So for me, uh, the new Ethiopia is not uh, an Ethiopia that knows its history. That's what I'll say to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I just want to know in the second film, uh, if the, uh, you have made research on the role of the Vatican Church and uh, it's included also in the narrative, I just want to know that. The Catholic Church endorsed the invasion of Ethiopia. And for me, it's, it's like, a, it's a fact. I show, I, I show you in the film Mussolini going to the Vatican, uh, Mussolini coming out of the Vatican, uh, the, the Catholic priest blessing the warriors going, my whole war begins in the invasion of Ethiopia with the Catholic Church firing the first bullet. That's all I can do. But it's not, you know, it's not a denied thing. They, you know, Italians, you know, the reason I'm making this film is because I was offended by Italians. I met them at Rimini Film Festival. 
and they told me, you know, Haile, we are not like the French, we're not like the Germans, you know, we are humanitarians, we build roads, we build hospitals, we fix the leper, lepers, and then I say, okay, I'll make a film. <laughs> and I'll let my father tell you. Hello, I've got just two quick questions. Uh, it with, uh, with regards to uh, decolonization, you know, um, I was wondering, were you ever able to track uh, some Africans who fought in, uh, that were in uh, Ethiopia? And secondly, the question is, um, what is, how do you weigh the importance of uh, the Ethiopian resistance to, uh, to, to the colonial power uh, in, the in the whole process of decolonization? Because us, we've been taught in school that it wasn't until the, the Africans who fought in the First and Second World War when they came back, when they went to Europe and they saw, saw the weakness of Europeans, they came back, and this actually was a catalyst. But how about the fight in Ethiopia? I'm sure it must have influenced the like of Nkrumah or um, how you call that, Lumumba, you know, those people who know the, 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 the underground narratives. But why is it that we're never able to actually um, set up the links between this very important part of history? My wife has made a film on Pan-Africanism. It's called The Footprints of Pan-Africanism. Uh, she goes into that. But I'll tell you, it's a fact. The fact Ethiopians, Ethiopia is not a, out, you know, it's not a rich mineral country like Congo. Ethiopia is not like Congo. But historically, Ethiopia is richer than Congo. If you look at Garvey's movement in America, they always prayed with the word Ethiopia, black Americans. Brazilians. When I went there, I was surprised how Ethiopia holds a big role in the freedom movement of African Americans. Okay? So, uh, it's very important to really know that Ethiopia was a symbol. In the, in the Pan-African movement, the first Pan-African Congress in Manchester, they make King Minilik the chair, the chairman of that gathering. These are the Du Bois and all the the you know Haitians all who got gathered in that period. Now contemporary Ethiopians, we don't know this part. African Americans, for example, enrolled to go to war. I go, I don't go in my film on that because I want to stay with Ethiopian point of view. But African Americans went to Ethiopia to fight also. Although they were being stopped not to go, not to succeed, they were recruiting people to, to go fight. So. In the Pan-African movement, there is history that has to be done. But I try to stay now with the Ethiopian point of view. Um, the um, uh, Nkrumah, Haile Selassie, when he disagreed with, he called Haile Selassie father. In the whole division, all the Pan-African leaders when they were fighting, Haile Selassie was mediating. In Pan-Africanism, Haile Selassie played a major important role. And Nkrumah's respect for Ethiopia is Adwa, Kenyatta, all uh, the boys, Paul Robson, they talk about Adwa. Adwa showed what can be. The Tsar gave Emperor Minilik a medal of honor. Um, I was talking about the other day. In, in, if you, at that time, there is now in the in French Museum, uh, women, and women in Iran used to have a fan with Minilik's face on one side and Ahitu's side. So anti-colonialism all over the world admired what happened in Ethiopia. It was a major, in fact, after the Adwa war, Ethiopia became a center of all the international news. You find Europeans all over, it's part of our weakness. That is also the period Italians built uh, satellites of consulates to mobilize Ethiopian defectors and collaborators. You see, internally, Ethiopia was weakened by Italian consulates. The one in Gondar, my father knew him very well. He was a very shrewd uh, consulate. And they were always going around and uh, poking at the division. Uh, the people who had problem with the em empire, central government, they mobilized them saying, we'll make you a king, Ras Hailu of Godjam, for example. If you see, uh, he's the most 
photographed a regional king, Ras, the son of uh, Ras Mikhail, uh, not Ras Mikhail, uh, Taklaimanut. He was the most documented. Why Italians photographed a lot of these collaborators? And the one in Tigray, Haile Selassie Guksa, who was married to Emperor Haile Selassie's daughter, defected, went all the way to Asmara and joined the Italian movement. And so Ethiopians were fractured when the Italians came. And I don't know if I answered your question, but to me, Ethiopia, I was amazed how much uh, my generation didn't know her, how much the world knew her when I left my country. I didn't even have idea what it was. One Ethiopian guy said to me, he grew up with me, in Washington, he was in Washington, he says, Haile, uh, Ethiopia is important. Uh, it's on TV all the time, I hear about Ethiopia. What? She must be a very important country. He's from my village, from my town. And so we were not aware of what Ethiopia meant. We took her for granted. We abused her because to change a country, to have the audacity to want to change a country you don't know itself shows you how displaced my generation was. If you look at Teza, that's what I'm dealing with, is displacement, intellectually displaced people are dangerous. Angola is a good example. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, please welcome Aile Grima. We are, Thank you. we are very happy and honored to have him in Brussels for two nights. So yesterday, we start with his own films. We screen uh, Hourglass and Bushmama. And we, are, we had asked to Aile to propose some film in parallel of the retrospective. So this carte blanche starts today. Uh, actually, there, is, there are three films. There is Medondo film, and then two um, American, Latin American, Latin American. Uh, work. So I will let uh, Aile speak about the choice of tonight. I would like to let you know maybe the, um, the dates of the retrospective. So it runs until April 8. No, sorry. Um, to uh, middle of May. Um, and please, this is a very unique opportunity to see the films. You have two chances to see Harvest uh, 3000 yeah. and two chances to see Teza as well. Uh, otherwise, the other films are, are really in, in this following week, so don't miss the opportunity. And at least I would like to thank our partners, Courtisan, of course, um, Jet Pomme in Paris, and the uh, United States uh, Embassy. So I'll leave you. The words. Okay. Well, two things. One, uh, I was asked uh, not only to show my film, I was asked uh, to present uh, to, uh, to you know films that are uh, significant in my own evolution, my own development, and uh, the two fil the three films I chose represent uh, the um, films that literally uplifted our uh, filmmaking uh, development. And fundamentally, when I was a student at UCLA, uh, we were in, 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 in this uh, concrete struggle against Hollywood representation of Africans. And so we created organization, the students, the film students, to bring films from Latin America and Africa. Sam Ben's Borom Sarat, Black Girl, Med Hondo, the, the film you're going to see from Mauritania, uh, Med Hondo's uh, um, San Hines' film from Bolivia, San Hines' uh, The Blood of the Condor is what you're showing. It's a very important film. And then Miguel Latin from Chile, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the Jackal of Naholtro. And these are films that gave us dynamic inspiration to turn into our own inner cultural uh, evolution. Uh, to me, uh, uh, it was a major uh, hormone injection, especially I come colonized by American cinema, I come colonized by American Peace Corps teachers, 
I was the first generation occupied by Kennedy's empire, imperial uh, educational in, uh, uh, aggression, whereby you develop an elite uh, that will guarantee the American way of life in Africa. Uh, these are young Peace Corps. They were 22, 19 years old. They were teaching us history. When I went to America, they were my classmates. I knew their history more than them because here I was taught by American teachers. When you take an American 19, 20 years old to teach in Ethiopia, he's teaching us uh, George Washington and the cherry tree because this is what he knows. And so we are the generation, in my view, that was displaced educationally. One, in my view, uh, the British, after the Italians' occupation, and before that also there is a Francophone and uh, Anglophone educational struggle going on to plant in Ethiopia. And the Italian aggression displaced that and replaced, and, and uh, therefore, uh, Emperor Haile Selassie was very Francophonic, um, then Anglophonic after he went to Italy for, uh, in, no, London, uh, where he resided through the five years of the, the Italian uh, struggle with the guerrilla fighters. And um, he, this educational system displaced, in my view, my generation. If we have to be honest, uh, we're being educated by an educational system that transplanted a thought system. We are thinking a certain way by that educational condition. Literally, the British designed it, and it mutated into American takeover. When the British were uh, designing it, they brought Egyptians and Indian teachers to perpetuate the British system of education. So our thought system, which comes from traditional different regions of Ethiopia, completely unified by this British idea, then American idea. I, two years of my life was in Jimma, where I went to school, high school there. I had the first Peace Corps teachers uh, in Jimma. And then when I went to uh, uh, Addis Ababa, Shibalis Habte High School, Peace Corps teachers again, and I end up in America following my teachers. And then after that is really a reacclimation. Now, it's in that period I'm meeting these films that I'm representing or presenting in this, uh, in this theater, the three films that are complete um, intervention to, dis, to uh, decolonize our mind. They helped us decolonize our thought system. Without those movies, I wouldn't have made Harvest, Teza, Wilmington 10, Ashes and Embers, or Sankofa. This is where I come from, and I hope especially young filmmakers could benefit from these films. The energy of these films of being anti-colonial, uh, in search of identity, because our children even that are born now, they'll be watching these movies because they are confused about their identity in the different countries we have, we are raising them. Again, thank you for coming. It is a way by way of introduction. I hope that does it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.